Uh, Rabbi Calvin. Thank you. <laughs> You all know the Maimar Chazal. We always begin by thanking the host, Dr. Suchaskis, for opening your home tonight. Uh, Dr. Chaskis sent me a text when he heard the topic of the class, and he was all excited because recently in Dafyomi, and we all know Michael Chaskis to be a Dafyomi, is a Dafyomi Jew taking Dafyomi, the study of a folio a day, very seriously. Right now it's discussing that the end of Abbasra, the various laws of inheritance. And he thought, this is why we chose this topic. And although it's serendipitous, it works out quite well, that's not the reason why we chose this topic. Others thought, perhaps, because in this week's parasha, we discussed the laws of keep it on the aim, the obligation of honoring our parents. And as we mentioned in Shalashudis, the idea from Rav Yagom, the reason why the Torah tells us that the reward for honoring parents is a long life is because when your children see you taking care of your parents at the end of life, They'll take care of you at the end of your life. And that also is quite serendipitous, but that's not the reason. There's really an 800 gorilla, 800 pound gorilla in the room, and those in young Israel are aware of this. The past few weeks have been very painful for many of us in Buffalo. We had a, a horrible loss. Uh, and I take personal responsibility for not informing, up until this point, my members and my friends and even my colleagues and especially those that I've helped convert to Judaism, about the importance of a halakhic will on one side and a health care proxy on the other side. In the past few weeks, thanks to the volunteering of time, various lawyers in our community, as well as uh, financial tzedakah, uh, that so many, particularly one couple here tonight, uh, without them it wouldn't have been possible to have been successful in providing uh, Miriam ben Basari Menu a Kfura. Uh, it was actually quite difficult. I think I mentioned to some people I was speaking to the bishop of the Diocese of Ontario, explaining to him that what we're doing is not a fight against Roman Catholicism, but this is a fight for what we think is correct to have what the Nisteris would have wanted, and he told me he could not have been more gracious. He disagrees with me, and he's going to fight along with the family. However, he understands what I'm doing, and I'm doing the right thing. And as I told members of the shul, if we think that by not signing a halakhic will or health care proxy, your rabbi will do everything with his power to fight for you, nevertheless, you are right. But you should make it much easier. And the purpose of the class tonight is to discuss these concepts, and these are very sensitive and very deep and very vast uh, ideas and concepts, and we'll try to get into them in depth, but really the focus tonight is to convince you. Anybody who has uh, joined us in our various classes on medical ethics understands that every hiccup of a question, every question of surgeries, to have a surgery, not to have a surgery, questions on the doctor, questions on the patient, <coughs> questions in halakha, questions in morality and mortality, we could spend hours on them, and we could go quite deep into these uh, subjects. However, tonight, because what we are going to be talking about is indeed so vast, we're going to really touch on them on a surface level. We're going to reserve the end of the class, I'm prepared to answer questions in greater depth, but as I mentioned, tonight's focus is to convince you of its importance. And to show you the vastness, just to give you a dogma, a comparison of how vast this is, for the lawyers in the room, and there are many, imagine today you have to research a question of law you're going to argue before the Supreme Court, and you would review 200 years of precedent, and you would review and spend hours upon hours and bill your client for those hours. Now imagine the same case 2,000 years in the future. How many more precedents you're going to have to review, case studies, and various new laws that will be written in those 2,000 years? The questions of will and health care and end-of-life issues in Judaism, the first written document that we have of our Torah Shabbat Tal was indeed written 2,000 years ago. And since that point, the various responsum on the subject, the various svarim, the books that have been written on these subjects, are too numerous to mention. 
and it is a sea, a true Yam HaGadol, that is impossible to swim in without drowning, especially in a 40-minute class. So, a few words of introduction. <coughs> the past couple of weeks in Young Israel with Yimin Hamar, we were talking about a sensitive topic of medical experimentation done by the Nazis Yimach Shemam on Jews and Gypsies, and its implementation today on patients in America. Can we use those studies? And we mentioned a beautiful idea that Rai Bleich, in his essay on the subject, ends with. Rai Bleich comes out that indeed it is legal in Jewish law to take advantage of these studies. And he tells the reader that the Talmud tells us, a very famous stitch of Talmud in Sanhedrin, document 9, page 17, side A, that to be a member of the Sanhedrin is not enough to be a Talmud Chacham, a scholar, as we all know, it's not enough to know the 70 languages of mankind, it's not enough to be familiar with the sciences and other secular knowledge. You have to be able to, you have to have the strength, the ability to prove in tens of ways that a sheriff, something that we all know brings impurity, is indeed tar, is indeed pure. You have to have that power of reason. And Tosfus asks, this doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. Kharifa ba'alma, sharpness for nothing is meaningless. What difference does it make if you're able for not to show that a sheriff is pure when we already know from the Torah that it is impure. And the Torah Tamima, the Torah Tamima lived about 60, 70 years ago, uh, I believe his cousin was Mayor bar Ilan, who founded bar Ilan University, he was the nephew of the Nitziv, and he explains as follows, that the most important quality, not just for a member of the Sanhedrin, but for a member of the Jewish people, anybody who is interested in understanding the true ways of the Torah of halakha, hashkafa, law and philosophy, is to understand that sometimes our own personal knowledge is counterintuitive. That sometimes all of our sharpness, what we believe to be completely true, has to be left to the wayside, and we have to surrender to what the Torah says. A member of the Sanhedrin has to be sharp enough to understand that in his own mind, of sheriff, why should that be impure? It should be pure but surrender to the knowledge that the Torah indeed calls it impure, and you have no choice. And when we enter such a topic tonight, we have to leave our personal opinions at the side of the road. And tonight's going to be a discussion of what the Torah says about these various topics. Too often, and I include myself in this, like to do the market gives a marshal of the, the archer who first shoots at the tree, and then paints the bullseye around it. <laughs> and too often, that's what we do. Those on the far right, we come up with our conclusions of what the Torah should say, what a religion that we would embrace would speak, and then we search and try to find it within the Torah. And so many of us on the far left, we say the same thing. And this could be very dangerous at times. And it's not just in halakha, it's also in the social. <coughs> When it comes to wills, you know, recently a member of the Beatles had, I believe, one of the most, if not the most expensive divorce in the history of the world. And I am certain that his lawyers and his friends were pleading with him, sign a prenup. And like so many people, he said, no, this is different, we don't need a prenup. He didn't want to listen to that objective voice. It is so important to listen to the objective voice, to hear the arguments that I'm going to lay out today, and to understand that you're not different. And your children, I'm sure, are very special, but they're not different. And to also understand this great misconception that rabbis will come and they're going to wreak havoc on your family, and they're going to extend life, because that's all they want to do is extend life, no matter how great the suffering. This is not true. There's actually a great irony. In 1772, the Duke of Mecklenburg issued a proclamation that became so influential throughout Europe <coughs> that one should not be buried until the body begins to rot. He was so afraid for himself and others that death, perhaps, the doctors are mistaken, it's not happening when they think it's happening. People have, in the history of the world, in a morgue, jumped up and have shown to have been alive, or perhaps they died and came back. Who knows what happened? And the Chetam Sofer and all the great scholars, rabbinic scholars of Europe, fought against this. 
and said, no, we bury right away. Even if there's a chance that indeed they'll come back and they're not really 